Hey everybody, welcome back to World History. So today we're moving on from ancient India and moving into ancient China. So go ahead and get your notes out and let's get started. So some things to kind of start off with. We've got some geography to talk about. So China is actually pretty decently isolated, whether that be from distance or physical barriers that include things like the Gobi Desert to the north, the Tian Shan to the east. Uh, west, you have the Himalayas to the south, you have rainforests uh, to the northeast, and of course you have the Pacific Ocean, and it essentially being considered the center of the earth for the Chinese culture. And it pretty much is at the center of the earth when we talk about latitude and longitude. So there's some geography influences as well. We have the Huang Yellow River, which I've mentioned previously, becoming a major hub for farming and trade. You also have the Shang River, which also becomes a big spot for population, as well as the transportation of goods and services. Um, a little bit more about the Huang Yellow River. Um, there's something in there called Los, or fine wind-blown yellow soil. It's why it's referred to as the Yellow River. Now, just like the Nile that we've talked about previously, it frequently floods, and it's known as the River of Sorrows. And at some points, it can destroy crops, it could lead to starvation, and the need to control that river led to a stronger government. A lot of their public works projects were designed to control the flow of water along this river. So a great example to come out of this is the Shang Dynasty, which we have some evidence from. That includes things like palaces, tombs, they drove out the nomads in the area. And a big thing that rose in ancient China was that of clans, or groups of families claiming common ancestors. That seems to be the biggest thing when it comes to Chinese culture, is that of the strength of the family and these clans. So we have Fu Hao, the wife of Wu Ding, a Shang king we're going to talk about. She was a warrior, politician, and spiritual leader, and she maintained a great status. If I remember correctly, this image uh, here currently on screen is that of her tomb containing things uh, such as various urns and whatnot for her to have in the afterlife. And then here's a statue of her. Um, she was believed to be one of the strongest female warriors of ancient China. Um, if memory serves, if you love Disney, um, part of her story is what inspired uh, Mulan. So there were some social classes as well to talk about. Um, you have the royal family, noble warriors, that tons of things, and they had things like chariots, leather armor, and bronze weapons. Next step down, you have your artisans and merchants, and then you have your weapon, more weapons, jewelry, and silk. Those were usually reserved for your upper echelons of society. And then your lowest class was the majority of your peasants, and they primarily were in charge of farming. Um, here's another image or two of some various things. So we also have the Zhao dynasty that eventually came over and over through uh, the Shang dynasty. And it established the mandate of heaven, which you defined on that vocab assignment, in terms of the divine right of rule. Now, the dynastic cycle is the rise and fall of dynasties. Basically, it's saying corrupt rulers, eventually that dynasty will fall and another one will rise and take its place. Essentially just adding that in there. So here's a great example of what the dynastic cycle looks like. Um, so essentially, it begins with a new dynasty beginning its rule. Generations pass. It, it becomes aged and declines. Usually a sign of that is higher taxes, protection weakens, uh, decay of infrastructure, corruption, those sorts of things. As a result, God then would become angry and take away the mandate of heaven and then a whole bunch of bad things would happen and a new dynasty would rise to take its place. So something else to come out of this is that of a feudal state in which supporters controlled various regions and an idea called feudalism, which we'll talk a lot more, um, especially in Europe, but it did exist in China as well. This is when lords governed their own land and but owed military service to a ruler. Essentially, it just meant that in exchange for owning land, we gave uh, military protection to the king. And in exchange, we then gave out our own land to various farmers for them to use. 
So there was a lot of expansion as well. We have a massive growth in economics. Um, ironworking becomes a huge thing. There's more food. They also developed large-scale irrigation as uh, included in this image up here. Commerce expanded as well, so they started to make coins. They built roads and canals, and the population massively grew during this time period as well. So in their religious beliefs under the Shang Dynasty, um, they prayed a lot um, to many gods and nature spirits. And a big tenet of their religious beliefs is the honor of the ancestors and the belief of Shang Di, the supreme. The king is the links people to God. Nobles and royalty could then influence the gods, whether to be provide good harvests, victory, um, or woes upon their enemies. So there are two major belief systems in Zhao China that we'll talk about. The first one being that of Confucianism under Confucius, who was a noble but poor. He established a bunch of rules of conduct and how to govern. He also wrote a book called The Analects. Now, he established an idea known as philosophy, or system of ideas concerned with worldly goals, such as social order and good government. We'll talk a lot more about philosophy when we get to ancient China. I mean, excuse me, ancient Greece. Now, he believed that five relationships shaped behavior, and harmony was achieved when people accepted their place. The ruler was greater than the subject. The parent was greater than the child. The husband was greater than the wife. The elder bro was greater than the younger bro, and friends would be equal. And they shared duties and responsibilities. The correct behavior to exude would equal order and stability for the region. Now, they would do something called filial piety, or respect for parents above all, and honesty, hard work, concern for others, and all of those sorts of things would make the ruler a virtuous and educated individual that would then be respected for that society. So this also ties into the idea of yin and yang. I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time going through this list, but again, yin and yang representing the two separate sides of um, life in, in the world. So here are some various quotes from Confucius. Um, my personal favorite is this one down here. It does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. That is personally my favorite. Um, we also have Laozi and Taoism. This evolved into a religion eventually, and they believed living in harmony with nature. And they believed in Tao, the way of the universe. They rejected conflict and strife. They were very much pacifistic. And they had the best go uh, government, but they governed the least in terms of their historical impact. So achievements of China. We have silk. This was a sec secret technique and a major luxury for ancient China, and it was their most valuable export for a long time. You remember previously I talked about how silk was something that really wasn't available in other parts of the world, and it really helped China grow their economy. We also have writing. They, it provided a lot of unity. Um, they had something known as oracle bones, or questions of the gods, and priests would then interpret those answers going forward. Um, they would use a number of characters or written symbols, and they practiced a style of writing known as calligraphy, or the elegant art form of writing. Their first books were actually the Book of Songs, which I believe is this image right here. And uh, this, is, if I remember correctly, is an example of an oracle bone. So that is going to be it for notes. I'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.